Today we're going to talk about gravity waves. And gravity waves is just the start, okay? And that will naturally lead us into talking about Kelvin waves, coastal Kelvin waves, which you've seen last year, and some of you, and uh, we'll extend that to equatorial Kelvin waves, and then we'll carry on the discussion to talk about all sorts of waves at the equator and the dynamics of the equatorial zone in general. So let's just get straight into it. So these are the shallow water equations that you've seen many times now. Uh, X momentum, Y momentum, and continuity, all written out with all the terms in them. And what we want to do is uh, try the simplest thing we can do for a wave analysis of these equations. So what you want to do is one-dimensional, non-rotating, linear system. So that means we've got to cross some terms out. So which of these terms do you think we should cross out? Let's start with one-dimensional. So what I want is a set of equations which are just in the x direction. So we're going to cross out the y direction. So this whole equation disappears, the y momentum equation, and there's no variation with y, okay? So this term, this du by dy term disappears, this term dh by dy disappears, and this term as well. So that's what's left after we've gone one-dimensional. Now we're going to go non-rotational. So we just cross out the two Coriolis terms here. And linear now. So we want to cross out all the terms which are quadratic in state variables. All right? So, for example, the advection terms, this term here, u du by dx, that's quadratic in u. So we cross out those terms. Okay. And there's a little subtlety here. This term here, we don't want to cross it out completely in the continuity equation because we say there's an average layer thickness, big H, okay? And that average layer thickness is a, a constant. And so that multiplied by this term is still linear. But it's just the variation of layer thickness, which we'll call eta, which we don't want to multiply by another state variable, u. So that's linearizing this term here. Okay? And then, of course, this term here is d eta by dt. Right? So what can we do with that? Well, what's, what's left over then is du by, an equation for du by dt, an equation for dh by dt, and we can just differentiate this equation with respect to t, and this equation with respect to x, and we can eliminate h between the two of them, and we'll get this second order ordinary differential equation for u. I've eliminated h, okay? We could eliminate u if you want, you get the same thing for h. Um, what we've got is a wave equation. So d squared u by dt squared is a constant, which is the square of the phase speed, times d squared u by dx squared. And the solution to this equation for u is just this propagating wave form. u is the real part of some amplitude coefficient, u tilde, e to the i, lx minus omega t. Now lx, l is the wave number in the x direction, so it's 2 pi divided by the wavelength in the x direction. Omega is the angular frequency, so that's 2 pi divided by the period. And expressed like that, that, that's a wave which is propagating in the positive x direction when L is positive. So if you substitute that solution into this equation, you immediately get this, which is the dispersion relation. Um, and it's a very simple dispersion relation. It's a dispersion relation, just to remind you, is a relationship between the frequency and the wave number. And it involves various geophysical parameters, in this case, gravity and the average layer thickness. Okay. So from this, we get straight away that the phase speed omega over L is just a constant root GH. That's the gravity wave phase speed. It's constant. It doesn't depend on wavelength or frequency. So the waves are non-dispersive. Right? Same phase speed for all wavelengths. So all different um, wavelengths will travel at the same speed. Any structure which is made up of a collection of different wavelengths will just propagate without losing its shape. So that's why the, what we say is there's no dispersion, right? So that's why they're called non-dispersive. And the group speed, d omega by dl, is the same as the phase speed because it's just a linear 
relationship between omega and L. So that's straightforward gravity waves. So the next thing to do is to put the rotation back in. Right, so we're going to put these F terms, these Coriolis terms, back in. The first consequence of doing that is that we go back into a two-dimensional situation. We have to. Right? We have to add this y momentum equation back in because the Coriolis force pushes perpendicular to the direction of movement. Right? So you've got this term here in the x momentum equation. F depends on v, pushing to the right. Okay? And in the y momentum, the x component of velocity uh, comes into play because you're pushing to the right northwards if you're going westwards, for example, in the northern hemisphere. So you've got these two equations now, and you've got the same continuity equation. And, well, what you could do is do what we did before and try to eliminate two of those three variables. You've got u, v, and h, or eta in this case. You want to have an equation you can solve just for one variable. You could do that. You, you could do lots of differentiation end up with a high-order differential equation for either u, v, or eta, and then put in the same wave-like solution for that variable and find a dispersion relation. We, we did that last year. We could do that. But this year, I want to do something a bit more direct. So instead of going through lots of algebra, eliminating terms, what we can do is, let's just say, let's put the solution in straight away, okay, into the three equations without eliminating any variables. So we'll, we'll say there's a solution for each of the three variables which is similar. Okay? U, V, and eta is some coefficient of amplitude, U tilde, V tilde, tilde, eta tilde, times this thing which propagates with a wave number L in the X direction and M in the Y direction. Okay? And then if you substitute that solution into these three equations separately, then the derivatives become coefficients, right? So d by dx is just i times l, d by dy is i times m, etc. Okay? So you can substitute all these derivatives because it's a linear equation and you just get an algebraic set of equations. Right? Three algebraic equations in three unknowns. The three unknowns are the coefficients of amplitude. And what else is there in there? There's basically three types of things in there. There's the coefficients of the amplitudes. There's the properties of the wave, so the frequencies and the wave numbers, and there are some geophysical parameters which are constants like F or H, okay, or G, right? And so what do we do with that set of equations? Well, what we're actually interested in is having wave solutions, okay? Having wave solutions. What we can do is we can write that set of equations in a matrix form, right? And so it's equivalent to this set of, this matrix times this set of amplitude coefficients. What we want to see is what happens when there's a wave solution. So what that means is we want to see what happens when these three amplitudes are non-zero. Okay, because this equation here, this matrix equation is trivially satisfied if there's no wave solutions. So if u tilde, v tilde, and eta tilde are all zero, then it doesn't matter what's in here, it's going to be satisfied. All right? So what we want is a condition for these three coefficients not to be zero. And if they're not zero, then the waves have some amplitude. Okay? So the condition for them not to be zero and for this equation to be satisfied is that the determinant of this matrix must be zero. Okay? So we can take the determinant of this matrix and set it to zero, do some algebra. You can do that yourself. It's not difficult. It'll take you a couple of pages. And you'll end up with this expression. Okay? Now, this expression is an expression which has wave properties, omega, L, M, and geophysical parameters. So what is it? It's a dispersion relation. Okay? So we've got the dispersion relation for gravity waves which have some rotation. And you can, well, first of all, you can see that uh, there is a omega equals zero solution here. If a omega equals zero is a solution, it's a solution where there's no oscillation in time. So it's a standing wave. There's a wave structure, but it's not propagating and it's not oscillating. It's just steady 
geostrophic flow. Okay? It corresponds to geostrophic balance. So it's like if we crossed out the um, d by dt terms in these equations, what you'd have there is geostrophic balance. You wouldn't necessarily have zero structure. You'd have a sloping surface, okay? and which would have motion associated with it, but it would be a standing wave. Okay? So omega equals zero there is geostrophic balance. Apart from that, if you set this part to zero, the rest of it to zero, then you have a dispersion relation for propagating waves. Okay? And you'll notice that it's the same as we had before, except for this f squared under the square root. Okay? So if you set f equal to zero, you get back what we had before. You just get omega equals k times root gh. So non-dispersive waves with a phase speed root gh. But the fact that this f squared is there now under the square root, that means that the relationship between omega and k is not linear anymore. And it's, it's plotted here. So if wave number is positive, we say we're propagating in the positive direction. If it's negative, we're propagating in the opposite direction. And this is frequency, okay, in the vertical axis. And these dashed lines are just non-dispersive gravity waves without rotation. And if you add rotation, you're adding this extra term under the square root, then you get this curve. So for large values of the wave number, that means short waves, okay, it's very similar. Okay, so very small scales, whether you've got your rotation or not doesn't make any difference to the way the waves propagate. But then as you go to larger scales, this, this curves around and flattens out, and in fact it comes to a minimum frequency, which is equal to f. At the limit where k equals naught, omega equals f. And so what's happening at that, that extreme? That this, this is a, a dispersive wave, right? It's called an inertia gravity wave, or a Poincaré wave. And at large wave numbers, it starts to behave rather oddly. Because you c if you look at the phase speed, it, it changes and becomes faster and faster. Right? As the, the, the slope of a line joining the origin to this curve gets steeper and steeper. So your phase speed becomes very, very fast as you get to, to um, larger scales. Whereas the group speed starts off equal to the phase speed and then it comes around and at very large scales it just disappears. There's no, there's no there's no actual transmission of information from one site to another, even though the oscillations that are separated in space are perfectly coherent. So that's not really a wave anymore. What it is, is coherent oscillations in space, separated by some distance. So they're, they're oscillating at the same frequency, f. They're not exchanging any information between them. It's just motion in inertial circles. So if you just set something going on the face of the Earth, it moves without any force acting on it, and it'll just describe a perfect circle. Um, that's the motion in an inertial circle, because it's the only force acting on it is the Coriolis force. And as you know, the Coriolis force doesn't exist. And in an absolute frame of reference, this thing is just going in a straight line, and it's the Earth which is turning. Right? But uh, from our frame of reference, it's doing this inertial circle with a certain frequency. And um, that's what we're seeing here. Right. So it's a bit of a negative result, really. Uh, we, we, uh, we're left wondering, is this really a wave for very large scales? Or is there a way of having propagating geophysical waves, gravity waves, at large scales? And the answer is yes, there is, of course. Otherwise, we wouldn't ask the question. And they're called Kelvin waves. So the next thing to do is to revisit this, this idea, but with a constraint.